is we want to make sure that the strategies that we use are always going to meet our value. That's our commitment, and that's the kind of uh, strategies that we'll be talking about today. So let's start where we need to start, and that's the audience. Because for you, your audience is your community, right? And in this community, you have cardholders, you have non-cardholders, you have families with children and without children. You have politicians and professionals, white-collar workers, blue-collar workers. You have students and dropouts and apartment dwellers and homeowners and homeless people. You could actually create some like-minded groups, segment them together according to their interests or ages or lifestyle, and chances are your library will have some one thing, if not many things, for every single group in your community. But of course, the trouble is, is that those people may not know that you have something for them. And that's where marketing comes in. Now, we're not going to talk about the full spectrum of marketing today. I'm really going to address email marketing only. And I'm not even going to talk about creating a marketing plan for your email marketing. What I'm going to do is talk about my experience working with librarians to create successful emails, plain and simple. And when I say successful emails, I mean successful communication, right? If you're on the fence, if you're not sure, should I use, should our library be using email? Should it not? Hopefully some of those questions will be addressed today as well. So let's start with why email? You know, everyone talking about social media and that's a hot thing and it's been a hot thing for a long, long time, but the bottom line is with email, it is the number one marketing tool that marketers still believe in. It's engaging. And when in used in conjunction with your social media, your news, your print channels, it's almost frightening how powerful that can be. I want you to think about something. Think about all of your cardholders, not just the people that come into your door on a daily basis, but think about all of your cardholders and put that number in your mind. Now think about, imagine trying to get a message out to 30% of those people. That's what email can do for you. You see, email is a scalable approach to reaching your cardholders. It's a consistent platform. It doesn't have commercials, all right? And the other thing that's really interesting about it is that even millennials love email. And the way that it's broken down in the marketing field is that what we know is that social media is a great social platform. People love to socialize on it. But when it comes to practical information, the number one choice is still email. So. Let's, I should have had an elephant here because I should have said, let's talk about the elephant in the room. But instead, I'm going to say, let's talk about that, that thing, that walking into the mouth of a crocodile or an alligator that every single library talks about their fear when they start talking about email. And that is getting subscribers. Because here's the deal. If you don't have subscribers to send an email to, you don't get a message out to anybody. And so it takes active participation. It takes an activity to get people to sign up to become a subscriber. And that's a little bit different than what most libraries are used to doing. Now, there's pretty much three, well, there's two strategies and one combination strategy that works to get subscribers. Okay, the first is opt-in. It's simple. Subscribers ask to have an email sent to them. You can advertise on your website. You can ask, they can ask someone at the library. You could ask permission when they get their card. But essentially, they have to say, hey, please send me an email. And that's the only way they get on the list. Right? This works really well, and it's great for privacy and it's a fantastic way, but you have to remember that if you choose this method, 
You have to promote your emails to people to get them to use it. You have to let them know that they have to sign up. And so you have to have some strategies in place that will get people to sign up. The second strategy is an opt-out. And that is a growing trend with libraries where a library will, they ask someone, they ask people when they sign up for the card that they can be included on the email list. But they essentially put all of their card holders into an email list and then they send them the email and they say, hey, if you don't want to get this email, opt out. They can opt out from a link on the email. They can come to the library and ask someone to remove them. Um, they can say when they get their card they don't want it. But the key to this is you have to make it easier to unsubscribe. All right? The combination is an opt-in, opt-out kind of thing where some libraries might actually send one email out to all their cardholders and say, listen, this is one time only. We're going to send you an email. If you want to get, if you want to hear about news and events or topics of interest, here, click here and sign up for a newsletter or sign up for an email, and we'll send you information. If you don't respond, we're not going to send you any more emails about news or topics. Okay, and you have to make sure you tell them news and topics because one librarian, one library did this, and they had tons of people scared that they weren't going to get hold notice. So you have to distinguish for your users, right? Um, it works. All of those ways work. It's just that each way you have to make a decision about what you're going to do and have something in place. So the question is, um, is it allowed to use email addresses from the ILS to send newsletters, or must they be collected separately? So it's, it's not can you or are you allowed to. The ILSs allow you to pull emails, but the, the question you have to ask from your library is how do you want to do that? Do you want to pull those emails and then send an email to say, hey, if you don't want us, you can opt out? Um, I'll talk later on about a campaign that we're doing where we actually had libraries send an email, a welcome email that said, hey, here you go, we're going to be doing this, we're going to be sending you information, and if you don't want that, um, then opt out. So there's lots of ways that you can do this, but this is your starting point, and this is a great place to have a conversation. Now, I have heard many stories of libraries where you have someone or a group of people that want to do email but staff is really afraid to send emails. It's your job and all of our jobs to explain the importance of being able to communicate about your services so that they can come on board. Okay? And so the question, ILS is a catalog. Everyone's on board with that. Okay. So um, out of curiosity, for those of you who are sending emails, um, how many of you are doing opt-out or opt-in or a combination? Go ahead and put that down. Now, Jocelyn has noted that Canada has anti-spam laws that prevent them from broadcasting. They have to do an opt-in. They also have a lot of different rules that, um, that are very safe. Um, Kansas, I just heard from someone from Kansas, they have also put in some rules in place. Um, so you have to be aware of your local government your national government, nice. But you can see as people are sharing what they do, there's a combination. And just a year ago or two years ago when we were talking about some of these strategies, there was some real debate about whether or not, what people would be doing. So opting in for applying for a card. So they have both. This is really great. So please do continue to uh, share your information. Perfect. Okay. So this is going to be an engagement. You're going to be absolutely chatting as we go along. Mostly opt-in. Beautiful. Now, I want, to th I want you to think about this. What do you think is the number one mistake librarians make with email marketing? Because that's what I had to think about when I was pulling together this webinar. Because I'm thinking, really, what's the biggest problem that I can see that is going on with librarians, right? 
not using it enough, no call to action, boring subject line, yep. All of these are so, so true. Boring emails, I love it. Too much info, too lengthy. You guys are professionals already. What are you doing on this webinar? This is absolutely right. That's right. No news, just events. So what I thought was that we confuse print with email all the time, right? So these are both cats, but they are definitely different animals, right? And that's exactly the thing about print and email. We in libraries think in terms of monthly newsletters. And for us, for many libraries, you spend a lot of time creating monthly newsletters. There's a system and a process in place. You create beautiful, some, I've seen beautiful print monthly newsletters that are 15 pages long, 24 pages long. You know, they're booklets. They're gorgeous. People take them home. They put them on their coffee table. When they have guests over, they bring it out and say, hey, did you see what my library is doing? Right? They're just beautiful things. Or sometimes you just do as simple as like this calendar that they pop up on the fridge. But the thing about print is just that. They take it. They put it on their coffee table. They read it. You know they read it lots of different places. But they have it in their house for 30 days. And so you can do monthly content with no problem. You know, you've got the pages and pages of events, right? But that's print newsletter. They're meant to be taken home. They're meant to be hung on the refrigerator. But that is not email. Email is read very differently. And as a matter of fact, there was a fun poll that was done by Adobe that they asked, you know, so where do you think that Americans check their emails the most? So where do you think? All of above, but why in bed, right? So which? TV, driving, in bed, or bathroom? Right? Yeah. See? We know our people. That's right. Yeah, the in, the in the car is a little scary, right? Why driving? I drive by some of those people who are checking email. They're, they're the ones that are veering off of the lane. Well, according to their survey, 70% watched while watching TV. 52% of people from bed. And while on the phone, 43%. And the bathroom, which we all know, 42%. I don't know. There's just something about checking email in the bathroom that is kind of like a little creepy to me. And then driving, 18%. And millennials? Millennials are also crazy about checking emails, but the difference for them is 70% of them are not watching TV. They're checking it in bed. But the point is, is that, oh yeah, the point is, is that they are reading your email where they are. And so whether it's at the dinner table or at coffee shop or walking or wherever they are on vacation, it means that that, that long print newsletter is just not going to work, right? It means that we have to keep our content short. People scan. They skim, right? And they're going to go right past your email. If it's way too long and it's not relevant to what they're doing today or this week, well, they're just going to skip right past that. So the biggest, the biggest problem is that we confuse all those print attributes to emails, and it is a different animal. And that's really what we're talking about today. So the biggest challenge, I think, and this is a trick question. You don't even have to answer this one, because the biggest challenge for creating a monthly newsletter is the fact that it's monthly. And that's our biggest challenge. And so what, while we're going we're gonna to talk about some key strategies if you are doing a monthly e-newsletter, but I also want to really encourage you to think a little bit out of the box and start to think in terms of breaking your content, perhaps instead of a monthly, into weekly. So these are the five key ways to manage content. You identify your top key messages. I mean, look at this. This is a long email, so you have to really identify what's most important. 
you have to know your call to action. Does everyone know a call to action means that in an email, you always want someone to take action, right? So we call it call to action. Do something. Sign up. Register. Learn more. Always an action. Edit, edit, edit. That's the number one thing. It has to be short. Kathleen's going to talk about this in detail on our next slide. Is one or two sentences. You have to put the most important things first. Remember, most of you are probably too young to remember the inverted pyramid where you know, your, your editor used to swipe from the bottom to the top until your paragraph was, could, could be the whole news story. Well, guess what? Now it's you start with a paragraph and we keep taking sentences off because one or two sentences. And then, of course, link them up. Always carry them over. Link them someplace else, right? So Kathleen will talk about this a little bit more in detail here. Thanks, Nancy. So here we've got a little bit of a closer shot of the top of the email that we had on the last slide. And so even though that email really had a lot of content, the top message, so in this case, at the very top, the take flight with your library card, it's prominent, it's large, there's an action that you can take and you can do something. So it's right up front. So it sort of does a couple of things here. It brings attention to library cards, and it gives them an action so that they can actually either go online and request one or find out more information. There's also been some editing. So even though there's a large amount of content, each individual thing here has been edited down quite a bit. So there's a sentence or two, and each one has a direct call to action. So read more here, learn more here. Um, it's very clear what action you should take. And so those actions are not only stated, but they're actually linked so that you can go somewhere and do something. So if you get this email while you're on your phone, you can click on it to read that article. Um, or you can find more information on the topic. So we got a question in the chat. So when you link them, do you send them to the library's website or do we send them to the description of the event? And it really depends. Um, when you think about that, what makes sense in the context of what you're linking? So if you've got a specific event registration, you can link them to that event. Uh, if it's a little bit more broad, you can link them to the website. So this is an example of Jacksonville Public Library's monthly email. Uh, these emails are sent out once a month, and they're beautiful. They have a ton of content, but they've done a really nice job here of breaking their content into different sections. So they start with their biggest event. In this case, it's Jack's Reads. And so it's got clear information on it. And here on this slide, you can see on the left just how long this email is. But there are clear divisions in these sections. So then it goes into uh, Black History Month. And even though there is a fair amount of text, it has been edited, and there are clear call to actions that link out uh, to their website. So if we want to take a minute and talk a little bit about design for emails. So it's extremely important to let the user know who you are. So make sure that your library is identified. Um, Make sure it links to your website if you have one. If you've got social media icons uh, or sites, make sure that you link out to those as well. Uh, you want your user to be familiar with the library and able to uh, reach out to you directly. Limit your color palette. Um, sometimes it's fun to go wild with a huge palette of colors, but that can be really difficult to read. So keep in mind that people are, if they're reading this in the bathroom or reading it in bed, it's often going to be on a tiny device. And so you want to think about those colors uh, as you're designing your email. Size your images. So your images don't all have to be the same size, but you want to make sure that they balance each other. Um, if you've got too many images that are too large, or if your images are too small, um, sometimes they can make an email look visually cluttered. 
you further want to unclutter it. So you can do that by adding sections to divide it up. You can do that through symmetry. So having, you know, as this email is divided into uh, columns, you can still play around so you have, you know, an area that's two columns, an area that's three columns, but you want to make sure that the content sort of is balanced. And so if you're going to have a larger email that talks about all sorts of different programs, you want to make sure that you've got clear headers and sections that describe that. So in this case, you've got the kids header. Uh, it lists a few specific programs, but then it links out to your entire online calendar. So we have a few questions um, about um, Design Mobile Optimize. So if you are, um, if you're using email and you're, it's not mobile optimized, just make sure that you have one column. So something like this shrinks down really nicely in one column. Um, it, the old style where you had the left-hand long column on the left-hand side with the table of contents and then all the information, stay away from that. Stay with one column and do that. Um, the other question was about linking back to the website. So if any municipal libraries are out there that they don't have a blog and they don't have a website, um, please share the strategies that you're using. Another thing that I want to add real quickly about uh, mobile designs, make sure that your email has an online view. So if there's trouble with how it renders, even if it's not a mobile view, so that your recipient can click on that and view it in a browser. Yeah. So and, and this this is, a, this is another uh, really nice example of a design that's got clear sections uh, where they have events. It's got a limited color palette. And even though there are less images in this email, it's not too dense with text. There are some nice breaks in white space. And so it's really easy to sort of scan this email and find out what makes sense that you're interested in when you're reading it. So this is um, our novelist news. And I show you this, even though it's not, it's, it's library content, it's relevant for a librarian. But I think um, Cassie here at Novelist is one of the best jobs I've done, I've seen in terms of a very classic email where you um, offer some content, short content, and bring it right over directly to a blog. And as you can see, you know, basically it's the same template that she uses. Each one is always into, broken into segments. Um, she uses our branded colors, which are really nice. She always highlights the top articles. She has three articles and then some training, something that you can sharpen your skills. Very simple, quick to scan down, fun photos that she uses. And I think um, what she does that I love so much is she writes great copy. She always something interesting. Um, she keeps it honest so that it's not uh, bait click or clickbait. When when you go to the article, this is the beginning of the article. She just really knows how to convey an interesting point of view on different topics. And not only do they get amazing uh, open rate, uh, they're always in that 30% category, which is really nice for an open rate, but on a consistent basis, we are always seeing about 50% of the people that open are also clicking on something. And that's really amazing because when it comes to emails, that's what you want. You want people to open and click, right? So that's, that's, that's your goal. Um, here's another one that I really love. We had um, Leah Sewell from Topeka give a webinar and Lori will be posting a link to that webinar up after the um, presentation is over. And she does something that I really love the approach that she takes when she does her quote unquote um, weekly newsletters. I call it the wandering style. She kind of wanders around the library and looks at what is marketing interested in and what, what's being highlighted in the library. She takes a look at her printed materials. She takes a look at all the things that are going on and then handpicks some things to focus for that week. 
And she brings an amazing skill set of designer, writer. She had been a sign maker. Even though this looks extremely easy to do, this is extremely difficult. This is a very high end of development for a newsletter. But I think, you know, I really wanted to share it because it's the idea. So, you know, 10 ways your library can brighten your week. And there's a nice rainbow, right? There's a book sale this weekend. Seniors eat well at the library. Really fun copy. And then this one I just love because this is, um, you know, about Kyle and how it has the little, um, you know, the, the, the knitted person. And this goes over to their blog where they're focusing on people in the library so it fits into what marketing is doing. But it's just a really wonderful, fun, playful way to get people to engage. She shares content. She talks about the people in the library. It's just a really beautiful uh, email. Some of the questions that we're having on, on information is about open rates. So I'm really impressed, guys, with 45% and 40% open rates. For the rest of you out there that are not getting 40 and 45%, don't feel bad. 30% is really a, a nice open rate, right? But remember, um, it's not so you have open rates, but then what you want to look at is your click rates because the open tells us that, yeah, someone's interested in your content, but the clicks are telling us specifically they want to know more, and that's the advantage of your email. Um, for those of you who have the 40-45%, are you sending to all your cardholders? Are you doing segmented lists? Share a little bit about that too because I think that will help our um, people. All right. This I love. Chapel Hill um, takes that same concept. They've really worked on a rebrand, and so their emails are getting very uh, concise, one column, really visual. Here's what's going on. Love what they do. They play with some memes. They're having a lot of fun with it, and they're getting some really great results on it. This one's from San Francisco, love it as well. And as you can see, San Francisco, they have a lot of content. But they are getting great open rate and fantastic click rates. So the content's really relevant to their readers, and they are driving people to use their collections and see their events. We mentioned this one because how many of you are still including uh, news from your director in your newsletter? I loved this because they actually put that at the very bottom of their newsletter. So they did all their visual on top and then did the news from the director on the bottom. Remember, you can also do a very short piece from the director and link back to your um, email, to your website and use that too. But you don't always have to do that traditional, oh, here's a welcome from the director. You can always put that someplace else. So when we started this off and we were talking about where everybody was from and the role, so there are some libraries that are a one-man shop. They barely get their print newsletter together, and they don't feel like they have the energy to actually create an email, a whole weekly or monthly newsletter. And so what they have is their print newsletter. Well, you know, you can always consider just linking out, do an email that says, hey, we've got a, um, our January issues out here, link to the online PDF. Um, we've seen libraries that also put the PDF of the front page of their newsletter and they can click through on that. Whatever solution that you work, you're working at a disadvantage, of course, because you don't have live links because you're just showing an image of that. But if you can get them over quickly to your newsletter to where they can see and click and get active information, it may or may not work. This had a 31% open rate, which again is great. Um, but again, you are missing out on the links. So. Here's a big question that we hear all the time, but I have so much to say. And, you know, the conversation is going on about um, 
news and what they do and how much you put in. So this is really addressing that. And so one of the things that we're going to say is that for those of you who are doing monthly newsletters, use that monthly newsletter as a springboard to generate people to participate in interest groups. And when we say interest groups, that means creating lists, um, well, we call them interest groups, where people can sign up and say, I'm interested in these topics. Not necessarily I want to sign up for a newsletter, but I'm interested in these topics. I want to know about programming for kids or families or adults or seniors. I want to know about computer classes. I want to know about um, genealogy. It's creating opportunities for people to say to you, I'm interested in this. And then when you have content that's relevant to that, you can send them that. And interest groups are really powerful. And so you can do it just as simple as this. This, I think this is a really perfect example of a very simple idea of an interest group. So this library had uh, people sign up if they were interested in book discussions. This is their email. Now, of course, they had the header on the top and they had the footer on the bottom. But it was really simple. Love to read. Discover a great new read each month. Book discussions. Great call to action. Click on that and it will take you to a list of the book discussions. They had a 19% open rate. Not so high, but really high click rate. So everybody that opened actually clicked through. And that is really fantastic. So this is something that a library had done too. You know, you're talking about um, not doing monthly and doing a weekly and do you really have time for that? And this is bare bones. This is, this is their header, what's happening this week, join us for these activities. This had 11% click-through rate. That means that of all the people that opened it, 11% of them clicked on these. That's a bad click-through rate, right? Um, but we were playing with this and we started to think about, well, okay, so this is bare bones. I don't have a lot of time. What might, what might a little bit more design look like? And Kathleen's going to run you through what this looks like. And so in this adjustment, all we did is we added a little header, and we started to pull out some of the bigger programs uh, so that they were listed next to each other. You still linked out for further details so there, you don't have a whole bunch of dates listed. But it sort of begins to uh, subdivide the email and highlight the more important events. All right. So I wanted, before we go on, I wanted to uh, answer a question. So we have 1,200 people on our subscription list, but I think a lot are old. So the way that we do it with Library Aware is we bounce. And once they bounce three times, um, then they automatically get taken off of the list. And so your, your email provider should take care of that for you. So moving on to what Kathleen was saying. So, so I got the great idea that said, Oh, well, what if we just add one picture? Wouldn't that be super easy? So I put this picture on, and I thought, well, we have two programs. I'll pick Laura Ingalls Wilder, Year of the Pioneer picture. And the minute I showed it to Kathleen, she's like, what? What is that? What is that about? The picture was so big, and it kind of threw her off because I had two different events that I was focusing on. And the picture was not generic enough that applied to both of them. So you look at Year of the Pioneer, and then you look at Valentine's, and it's like, oh, this doesn't make sense at all, right? So then Kathleen, in her wonderful bit of wisdom. And so what we did here is we went back to the sort of the two column for each event and added an image per event. And that way it made it clear that, you know, the, the cake picture goes with the one, and your little heart drawing goes with your Valentine's story time. So right. you've got the, the benefit of having the image there that adds a little bit more interest. These image, images actually match uh, what was available when you uh, clicked on the event on the website. And so same as the edits before, all of the dates aren't listed, but instead they link out to the website so that you can see um, all of those dates. The descriptions are extremely short. Uh, but they link to where you can get uh, more details. Uh, right. Another thing that we added here was the, the original had an actual email address, 
And we just made the uh, email us an actual mail to link. So, so for those of you, uh, a mail to link means that when you click, when a person clicks on that, it brings up an automatic email. You get to put the subject line in. You get to put a little starter content. So it makes it easy for you to field those questions. But it also makes sense that if you're sending an email, don't make them call you. Go ahead and put the email, right? So there's been some questions around the whole idea of content. And, you know, monthly emails are so long. How do I edit them down? Um, it's only a one-man shop. How do I do a weekly? So remember we talked about edit, edit, edit. It is probably the most difficult thing that you can do is to really think in terms of what is what would be of interest to my users. But you have to remember, if you click back to your calendar of events, what you're essentially doing is you're, you're saying to them, here's one interesting thing, and when you click here, you get to see all of the interesting things. You can't possibly highlight everything. You ha but you can concentrate on one, and one representation that might bring somebody over. Now, you can do things as simple as, uh, join us for special activities. Check our event page. You don't have to list everything in an email. You just want to give them enough information that they would want to click and move on. As far as um, a weekly email, you know, the question is and will always remain, how often should I send an email? What's too much? What's not enough? Well, we go by this. If you don't have something really, really important to say, don't send an email. So if you want to send out a monthly email because your customers might be used to and they might like that, but then you want to mid-month send out some reminder of, hey, don't forget we've got some really cool programs going on. Check out our event calendar. It's a nice follow-up. So you can kind of um, use the email to better engage and keep in contact with your customers, but you don't have to put it all there. Um, this, as a user who receives a lot of email, I can't stand a lot of email. I automatically de delete if I get too much. Well, you know, that's really interesting because that's true. That's one reason why people will delete emails is because they get too much. But the major reason why people delete it is because not just too much, but it's not relevant to them. And so, Again, it goes back to that interest group. If I want to know about family programming and you're sending me only family programming, I don't care how much you're sending me as long as it's relevant. So you, so you have to balance between the amount of emails you send and how relevant they are. I love this one, Florham Park Public Library. They have a monthly movie night. They send this out. It's not a huge mailing list. It's a couple of thousand. Um, they send it a few days before the movie. Uh, they get 25 to 29% open rate, and it's just a nice reminder. Uh, there's no links, which, you know, we're always saying link, 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 link. They could link back to their page, but in this case, it really works as a reminder. So for those of you who just have an ongoing program and you hear from people, oh, I keep forgetting you have that program, we'll send them a reminder but make it visual, make it graphic, make it simple for them to look. And in this case, send it a couple of days ahead of time. So um, one person saying that weekly is too much. The email lets people know what's happening for the month. They go out to the website and see what's up. That's perfect. So, you know, what I'm going to say is that you have to gauge your people. When you get unsubscribed, that is a red flag to tell you that something's going wrong on your email. So if you went from sending a monthly email to weekly and all of a sudden you see unsubscribes, well, that pretty much tells you that that might be too much. Um, once a month, once every two weeks, start to gauge it. Um, go less, build up, that kind of thing. Um, so this is something that we thought, Kathleen and I were looking at this, and it's, we're going to say keep your focus because 
here is a great looking email, and we love this. As a matter of fact, each of those books actually sends you to a search, so you can find a search in the catalog on all of these different topics. Um, friendly, great tone, it's a cookbook, it's a targeted list, um, and it had an 86% open rate. That's like amazing, right? But the uh, click rate was really low. And so when we looked at it, we thought, hmm, what's going on? How come the click rate is low? And this is something that all of you can do when you start to look at your emails. Because remember, it's not right, wrong, good, bad. It's just, hey, what worked, what didn't work, and let's take a look. I know, cooking and booking, isn't that great? So here we go. Kathleen, tell them um, when we looked at this, this top section, we thought that's really the focus about this. It's really about we have this cookbook club. We want you to come. It's on the date, and this is the time. And we put a big button that said learn more. That's your first call to action. Let's get them involved. Let's tell them more about the cookbook. We don't have to talk about it in the email. Let's just get you there, right? And then here, the amazing recipe makeovers, we just focused on one. Maybe there was just too much information. And so here we focus on, and we also tell them that we're going to click on the book to get a, a list of cookbooks. Because we were thinking when we saw the book jacket, we thought, oh, does that take you to a specific book? So if it's not really clear, tell them. And then give them a little bit of detail. And then rather than have all of those dates be a focus, save the date. Here we go. Here's what's coming up. And the next month, you can focus each of those. And then, of course, your questions, email, that goes to a mail to, and then, of course, the um, phone number. All right? Um, less choices, better for someone that reads the email. And so this is something that we've said a couple times, is that you want to really focus on those niche audiences. So if you've got 20 or 30-somethings, create a group and send them emails specifically so that it's content that relates to them. Because if, if your recipients are engaged with your email, they're not going to unsubscribe from it. Uh, you want to hit the people that are going to be specifically interested in your email. And so these are two really great examples um, of simple emails that go out with a uh, very positive results. Yeah. So the other thing I want to talk about is, remember when I started off about the Sphinx and sending, you know, the, the body and the human? So a lot of you are using um, some constant contact, MailChimp, Emma, Library Aware. All of you are using different programs. The thing that we notice most and the things that studies tell us is that you are a library. You are not a retail store. You are not Ann Taylor. You're not Talbot. Subject lines, why they're important, one of the most important thing that you can do in your subject line for you as a library is to say you're the library. Because you see, we have a very unique relationship with our patrons. We have trust. And if they hear from the library and you give a clear description of what they're going to find in there, they want to open. And so subject lines while they're important, for libraries, there is a different approach to it than for your corporate or for your retail stores. Because remember, retail, they're trying to sell you something. So they're trying to get past that barrier. They're not, you know, when <laughs> if I get one more 20% last chance, 20% off from Pottery Barn, I'm going to laugh my head off. Because, you know, at some point, I realize they're desperate. They just want me to buy something. Whereas every time I get something from my library that tells me about the program that I signed up to know more about, I'm opening those. You know, so remember, part of the subject lines are great, but the most important thing that you have going for you is trust with your audience. And that no re retail store has, no corporation has, as well as we have. I just... So... You know, again, we're engaging your audience. Um, but what we wanted to talk a little bit about is the using RA for 
solving your problem or a problem with an email. Um, so Lori is going to put a poll up about form-based reader's advisory, how many of you actually use form-based while we talk a little bit. So here at Novelist, you are our customers, you're librarians, and you're our first line of customers, and then we try to help you with your customers who are your patrons. And so we created what is called the Novelist Book Squad, and it's 13 different interest groups on all phases of reader's advisory, and we have the most amazing writers, most amazing emails, just amazing work that's being done. Um, but when Kathleen and I started to work with them, we really started to look at what does it look like to solve a reader's advisory problem via email. And it, for us, we broke it into five areas. Identify the problem, share your expertise, address trends, topics, news, link back to your website or printables, and offer tips for using your library. And these five steps for anyone that's trying to really engage your readers in solving their readers' advisory problems is really effective. So I'm going to show you what this looks like. So the first thing is identify problems. And when we talk about that, we talk about writing in a very friendly, casual tone, identifying what the problem is. In this case, um, we're saying, hey, are people coming to you about Christian fiction? Do you know how to point them in the direction? So whenever you do an email, you try to, you know, what is the scope? What are you talking to them about? And in this case, it may be for you, you might be saying, are, are you looking for great Christian fiction, right? So you identify the problem. And then what you do is you start to share your expertise. Email is where you get to shine. Talk about what you know. Share what you know. In this case, I mean, we're really blatant because we weren't sure, did people really know the spectrum of Christian fiction. You know, share what you know in your emails. Keep it light, very short, but enough that you're talking about so that they can, they know, oh, I'm an expert. Address trending topics and news. Don't be afraid to integrate what's going on in the outside world to connect to those reader's advisory recommendations, right? Pull it in, let them know. You're human, you're reading the same newspapers, you have the same things going on in your life as they are, identify. And then link, like we keep saying, is link back. But in this case, what you want to do is link back to your website. In our case, we're saying to you, hey, here's a great flyer you can print and post. If you use a flyer, you may say, hey, um, here's a great you know, selection of books, but link back to a search, right? So. A question came up about reader's advisory problem. So RA problem means that when you're trying to, through newsletters, help people make choices about reading choices, whether that's a newsletter for a reading list, whether it's form-based reader's advisory where you have a place where people can ask you for customized reading lists, um, whether you are cross-promoting your collections and talking about the different reading selections that you have, that's what we consider a reader's advisory problem. Because we pro approach everything from the point of view that says, tell us your problem and we're going to help solve it. So in this case, maybe a better terminology might be helping readers find the right reading recommendations, right? And then lastly for us, we offer tips for using our content. One of the things that you is really great in emails is that you have an opportunity to click back into your product, whether there are products that you want them to use, reading lists that you want to make recommendations to, but essentially what you want to do is always remind them, hey, we have some really cool stuff on our website. That's our virtual branch. Let's get you over there so that you know what's going on. In this very simple email, we had a 37% open rate, and 45% of those people that opened it clicked on something. That's the kind of interaction you want with people. Now, you can see this is fairly long. So when you guys are saying, oh, how do we keep it short? You want it short. But if it's interesting, if it's relevant, if people really enjoy reading what you're writing, they will, they will enjoy a longer content.
We also find that personal and engaging writing, I mean, what can I say? Our librarians here at Novelist, they are amazing writers. But what really makes them amazing is not just their expertise, but they're very real. They, were li they are librarians, they know what you're facing, and they share on a very down-to-earth level of talking to people. And it makes it very appealing. You as well want to write personal and engaging content. And then a little tip that we use is, you know, if you're making a flyer, a reader's advisory flyer that you might be hanging up, put it as a visual. And then what we say is any visual that you use in your email, hey, hang it up in your library or bring it to your outreach because you want to really bring home the idea, I saw this, oh, there it is there too, right? And then this is another really great example. Patrick Holt puts these together. Um, this is really just a simple template that he works. And you can see here, black and white cover, and then here, changes up the topic, a new graphic, and it really works beautiful. And again, for those of you that are doing form-based reader's advisory, simple three steps. Introduction, do your book jackets, annotation. In your introduction is where you get to be personable. And the same thing here. You want to have fun with some reader's advisory? If people are asking you for choices, have fun. You don't have to list all your books there. Just put something like this, sparkling new books, here's the five choices, and send them to your online reading list. And lastly, what I want to talk about is email campaigns. So we will also give you a link to the wonderful webinar we did with Jacksonville and Charlottesville where they had done some campaigns on email. This is our newest one that we're doing in Library Aware, and we're just so proud of it and proud of the libraries that are participating. I just wanted to share. Um, our goal was to make it really simple for them. So what we did is we created all these templates. And based on the marketing strategy that says, if you have card holders and they're they, new card holders or, and they don't know about some of your online resources, what are the best resources that a card holder would want to use? And we broke it into online courses. Um, and we also broke it into um, online collections, because those are things from people from home that they can get into right away. And we created this content. Um, we made it generic enough. Our pilot program is running six months to a year. We, as you can see, we did the content. They were able to insert a logo. They could pick. What did they want to promote? We didn't choose that for them. They chose that. And essentially what they did is the first month, they sent out a welcome newsletter to all of their card holders. Some had uh, not all of their card holders, but selected. And then the first month, we're only one month into this, but the stats are overwhelmingly amazing. So Washington County, they sent it out. Not only did they have an open rate of 38%, um, but Ross Figura, Figura, who you know sent us an email, and he said, oh, he was a little bit disappointed in his click rate. But when he went into Mango, he actually saw that the increased usage was about 16%. That's amazing. One email and you see that your online uh, Mango languages was increased by 16%. Um, this one, Mercer County, they're doing something fabulous with this campaign. Not only are they doing the campaign, the email campaign, but they're using it as an opportunity to train their staff about the different databases and they're also doing, um, they're adding classes that coincide with what they're promoting. So they're really doing a full campaign. First month out on Ancestry.com, they had to add two classes. First, the one class filled up. The other two classes they had to add. And what they were telling us is that they are also seeing increased number of questions about Ancestry. So they're getting the awareness out to their customers. And then here... This is Prescott Public Library. They sent it out, and the, just the welcome email, they connect it to um, their website with research information. And they actually had their patrons emailing them back with lots of, like, wow, thank you for sending us this. You know, and here's libraries so worried about sending emails. They're having patrons that are saying, yes, 
Thank you, thank you, thank you. This is awesome. We really appreciate you telling us about these resources. So when it comes to email and it, and it comes to sharing and marketing and telling people what is going on in your library and you get this kind of response back, you just have to really under, say to yourself, wow, this is really valuable for our patrons. Um, and so, any questions? We are at 3.02. We went two minutes past. If you have additional questions, you know, if you have to go off, we totally understand that. If you have additional questions, please feel free to ask us, and we will include answers. We'll stay on, answer the questions, and then that will be part of the recording. So when you get your recording, you'll get that participation. So thank you so much, everyone, for participating. So uh, we use to track our clicks and rates. Um, for us, we use LibraryWare. Um, anyone that has, if you use an email program, they would be able to tell you clicks, um, opens, opens, clicks, unsubscribe, bounces. And as I said, um, we will link you to the other webinars that we did. This is just one of a series. Um, as far as setting up interest groups through Library Wear, uh, Emma, we can tell you that directly. It's really super simple. You just go in, click interest under subscribers, add interest groups, and you can do that. Um, we'll make sure that we include a link on how to do that to uh, when we promote this to our Library Aware subscribers. So how does a branch library accomplish some of these email suggestions when the PR marketing department at the central library is charged with this? but usually only does PR for the entire system. So I really love that question, Irene. And I think what's most important is that you sit down with your marketing department and really start to talk about what they're looking to achieve and what you're looking to achieve. And, you know, some of the conflict might be that they want to promote programming. Um, you can make the argument for the fact that you are looking for subscribers only within the reach of your branch. You could make the argument that says you really want to focus on reader's advisory rather than programming. So I think the idea is to work with your marketing department to say, what are their goals with the email? What do you hope to achieve with your email? And then work that through so that you can both meet your goals without conflicting. How do I print slides? Oh, OK. Um, so we are going to link, send a link to this webinar. You can share with your staff. It will, um, all of the, it, you can share it. It's totally recorded. And Lori just published the link to our Book Squad newsletters. I really hope that all of you take a look at those. I'm telling you, we thought people would only sign up for one or two. People want all 13 because the content is so relevant to the work that you're all doing in the library field, you are just going to go crazy over them. <laughs> 